Welcome to the Byways of Southern Vermont. This is a collaborative work of GNAT TV and Alsing Productions. I'm your host, Greg Cutler. We're going to explore some of the back roads of Southern Vermont where you often find its most characteristic places and people. We're in the Range Rover Evoque, which has been generously loaned to us by the Land Rover Driving Experience at Equinox Resort. I think you're going to enjoy this. Welcome to the Stone Valley Byway along Route 30 in southwestern Vermont. I'm your host, Greg Cutler, and we're going to take you on a tour of some of the wonderful quintessential towns, fertile valleys, marble and slate quarries, and along some of the beautiful lakes, like the one that's right behind me. We're going to travel from Manchester, Vermont, all the way up to Castleton, Vermont, and see some historic sites along the way and meet some of the people. So let's hit the road. Our focus is on a southwestern section of the state of Vermont. That's where we'll find Route 30, the Stone Valley Byway. It takes us from Manchester, through Dorset, Hallett, Wells, Poultney, by Castleton, and into Bomazine. For our story, we'll take two side trips to show you more local flavor. Our second side trip takes us across the state line into New York to learn more about Slate, so let's begin our trip. We'll start in Manchester, where you'll find lots of great shopping and more. And then we'll head north towards Dorset. Along the way, we see some interesting open spaces. Often along the Stone Valley Byway, you'll get a glimpse of different modes of transportation. Here, we have the Vermont Challenge. And then the next day, we might see hundreds of Model Ts heading to a car show. And then there's an amazing tractor collection. I'm with longtime resident uh, here in Dorset, Terry Tyler. Thank you for having us into your beautiful home and I love the orchard and I understand that you still mow this yourself at oh yeah some three and a half hours or so out there but it's absolutely gorgeous and there's 60 some uh, 62 trees to drive around which is also yeah. makes it interesting what are some of the things if somebody if you were to tell somebody about Dorset why did why somebody might want to come and explore Dorset and the surrounding area uh, um, some of the highlights well you know, probably the, the marble quarries and the marble industry that used to be a, a good income for Dorset right. uh, back in the 19th and early 20th century yeah. uh, is, was very important then and is very picturesque now. The quarry, particularly the main quarry over here on Route 30, uh, from which came the marble to build the... Uh, New York Public Library, the Harvard Medical School, and right. other famous buildings. And it's a swimming hole, a beloved swimming oh, yeah. hole now. Oh, yeah. I was about four years old when my father first took me for a swim in the quarry. <laughs> and over the years, it's gotten more and more popular. And I understand that the quarries, there's, the, if you go up behind there, which now is... I believe closed off from private land, yes. but there are other quarries. 29 of them on that mountain. On that mountain. Yeah. The marble vein that runs uh, from Green Peak up to Danby Mountain and, and on up the valley uh, in places, the marble is 1,800 feet thick, according to uh, 
Ernest West, who ran the quarries. If somebody visits the historical society in, in the middle of town, a lot of that history is there, I imagine. In Dorset. Right in Dorset, right, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a whole room dedicated to the uh, marble industry. Right. Now you've seen um, Williams General Store through the years and yes and there's been recently a lot of change but over many years not so much change and was that the the place that you went all when you were young was that pretty much Oh definitely yeah. it, it was first started in 1840 uh-huh uh, William Williams and then uh George and Charles uh, <clears throat> Williams took over after that his sons and uh well, see, I guess George was in the Civil War, right? And and uh, then Herbert Williams took over around the turn of the nineteenth to twentieth century, mm -hmm. and uh, it's basically it's been added on to some uh, from the original store, but uh, one addition when we took part of the wall apart when they were. It, it, it was all lined with 1854 newspapers, so obviously oh. that's when that was built. Right. But if you're visiting today, it really harkens back. There, there's plenty that you can do in Dorset and see oh, yeah. in Dorset to um, get a sense of, of the history. Yeah. And it's quintessential, uh, wouldn't you say, that the green area is a, just a quintessential slice of, yes. of Vermont and Most early American history. Yeah, most of the, well, for instance, the Dorset Inn was built originally in 1795 yeah. and is probably the longest continuously operated uh, hotel in, in uh, Vermont. Right, right, right. And the Dorset Theater Festival, the Dorset Theater right there is uh, being operated. Oh, yeah, very famous. Uh, the, that was constructed from a couple of old barns, one of them up here on the hill. Uh, and that was before my time too, but mm -hmm. just <laughs> 1828, uh, 1928, 29, and uh, and it it has been redone uh, recently, right. and uh, and then uh, there is a field club in Dorset. Oh, there is. If you uh, want to play golf <laughs> and you're so disposed, and you have a deep pocket, and you can join the Dorset Field Club and play golf there. That field club was started in 1886, and the the fairways were kept down by cattle. And then in 1896, they built Woodruff Hall, which is there now is is their clubhouse. The clubhouse. And that was revamped a number of years ago, and then they added another nine holes clear over into, onto the West Road. I used to visit in the early well, mid-70s and would come to Dorset and go to what was then Pelcher's um, and now is the Dorset Union Store, which is also, I, I believe, one of the longest continuously operating country stores in the United States. Uh, is that right? 1816, I think, is, it was the Dorset Union Store there, and it is now. Yeah. It and was spent, Union before there was a Civil War, and it's now the Civil War is over 100 <laughs> years past. It's Union again. But that's definitely a stop that people should oh, make in addition yeah, to Williams. Absolutely. Right. It, it's really fun to go through now. It isn't overcrowded. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Just down the road from here, there's a, a giant, beautiful marble house. It's on West Road, and people coming up here should definitely take West Road and the, the main thoroughfare. Yeah. Uh, it's well there. worth looking at. What's it was built by Edwin Lefebvre, who was a Wall Street person mm -hmm. and a good neighbor. Uh, but that marble house is beautiful. It has been added on to and it has formal gardens that are all had marble fountains and everything down through. Right. Well worth looking at. Yeah, it was built in 1814, place. I believe. And the other marble that people will see are the sidewalks in town yes which is a great uh, they're aspect still they frost heaves and broken in places and they're not reset in concrete uh, right. as manchester has done <laughs> well thank you very much thanks Please. for spending the time with us well glad to the next section of our journey takes us from dorset to Paulet.
we come across a piece of history where in 1785, Vermont's only coin was minted. The lush land in this valley is the heart of many. And we soon enter Pollock. A quaint little village of self-sufficient means. Its general store, like so many in Vermont, has everything you'll need. These small towns are vibrant with community activity. As we continue past Paulette, we drive deeper into the Meadowy Valley, a lush, fertile basin which sustains a vital agricultural industry. The Meadowy Valley is one of the six most valuable farming areas in the state of Vermont. Today in our travels, uh, we're in studio with Alan Calfigu. And Alan, we're talking about the Meadowy Valley and specifically Haystack Mountain. That's right. Um, take us into the valley and take us up to the trailhead and all of the things that somebody would need to know to take full advantage of an experience okay. uh, of the mountain. I'd be delighted to. Okay. Uh, Haystack Mountain is really, I, I kind of consider it the gateway to the Paulet Valley, especially if you're coming from the north end of the valley. It's that large, iconic mountain, uh, bare, summited. Uh, it's, a, it's a relic of glaciation, actually. Mm -hmm. The glaciers uh, in Vermont were almost a mile thick. And if you can imagine them coming over the top of this mountain and they grind the north side of the mountain smooth and then the south side of the mountain really is where the debris and stuff tumbles off so it's kind of ragged and, it, and a haystack has that beautiful kind of whale back shape. Yeah. So it's a remnant of the glaciation. But it's an it's emblem of Paulet. I mean, it's from even in Wells and Granville and Rupert and Paulet, you see this mountain, it dominates the the uh, skyline. The icon of the valley. It really is. Yeah. You know, you can't even imagine what the Paulette Valley would be like without Haystack the Mountain. Uh, how, how you get there is on Route 30. Right. And if you're coming from the south, from the town of Paulette, it's probably two and a half or three miles from downtown Paulette. And you take a right on uh, Wait Hill Road. Okay. And uh, then you go up maybe a half a mile mm -hmm. and there's uh, an intersection with a town trail called Tunket Road okay and that's where you have to park out of the way and there's actually some decent signage there that will direct you to the trailhead and it's a beautiful uh, probably 45 minute walk which is one reason why it's so popular because you get up mm -hmm. on the top of this beautiful summit with a 360 degree view of everything around you. Right. And where, where else can you do that? Right. Um, and Is it moderate? How would you rate the, the hike? I, I mean, some of it's moderate. The last little bit of it is, is pretty extreme. I mean, you're getting up on the top of that summit. Right. Right. But the summit is only like 1,900 feet in elevation. So right. it's not a long climb. Right. But the last part and of it. And completely is, worth it. I mean, the, com re the big reward. Completely worth it, yeah. yeah. You look west out across the huge old uh, seabed or Lake Valley towards Glens Falls, you know, all the way to the high peaks in the Adirondacks, and you look south through the, you know, beautiful uh, Paulet Valley down. Right. You see hey, uh, Mother Myrick and Equinox Mountain off in the distance. And you then, get a, a great sense of the Stone Valley Byway from that vantage point, it's, actually, it's right? It's probably the best way to really get, take in the, the Stone Valley, because right. from that Taconic, it's a Cambrian rock, so it's about 500 million years old. Uh, you look west and you see all the slate quarries right. over there. Right. And, uh, to the south, again, you see some of these other mountains that are very iconic to us traveling in the valley. How did you get... Um, historically involved uh, or, or what was your interest and in, uh, your resident yeah of that area I'm a resident uh, of the town of Dorset right I'm a, a forester 
uh, okay. by training and, and practice. I've been doing that about 20 years. Uh -huh. And um, as a part of that, I, I somewhat have a love for geology and the geology of the region, which is right. fairly complicated. And um, also special natural places. And Haystack is a very, for such a small little area, it's a very, very biologically rich area. Right. It has forests on it that really you would think you would find much further south, like Pennsylvania or places like that. You know, three or four different species of oak and very, it's very dry, warm climate, very right. different even than six miles to the south. So huh. it's biologically unique that way. Right. And has some very special uh, natural communities, so groups of plants and animals on it. Uh, some that are associated with the rock outcroppings on the summit of the mountain and some that are associated with these sort of dry forest types. Right. Uh, and then it has a peregrine falcon nesting site. Okay. And the peregrine is actually one of our great success stories in endangered species. It's been removed from the endangered species list because of its success. And uh, so it's just, it's, it's uh, a biologically interesting place to go and it's, it's a great hike. Right. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, almost like from a plane, you can see, you know, the landscape below in the forest and at, at any time of the year, you know, it's just a beautiful place to get a feel for this landscape we live in from a, you know, bird's eye view. For both residents and visitors alike, this oh, is a yeah. great day hike. Yeah. Um, or just a great visit to the area. Yeah. And it should be noted, I mean, it's, the, the mountain itself sits on a small parcel of land, but it's now surrounded by almost 900 acres that have been conserved by the Nature Conservancy in what they call the North Pollitt Hills natural right. area. Right. So, you know, you can also explore around uh, the other of the three sisters. There are actually three mountains, Haystack, Middle Mountain, and Bald Mountain that make up right. this little chain. Right. And so there's lots of exploring to be done there. And, um, Nature Conservancy allows hunting during hunting season and, yeah. you know, it's just a beautiful little preserve right in our backyard. Just another great, great stop on the byway of yeah. southern Vermont, one of the, the Stone Valley byway. It's yeah. one fantastic. But people, you know, people come to that from, I would say, all over the world. Yeah. Uh, there's an impromptu Facebook site that was set up and people record their experiences and it's amazing. Oh, good. You know, the people from, from everywhere and in the trail register too, you can see. Uh, I was about to say, how do people learn more about it online? Is there a there uh, you can go Facebook to, uh, yeah there's a f uh, Facebook page uh, and the friends of haystack uh, friends of haystack dot org right. has a lot of information and some good maps about it and uh, also the Vermont chapter of the Nature Conservancy has information on their website about the mountain itself and the North North Pollitt Hills Preserve okay including maps and directions on how to get there great thank you very much excellent thank you. <laughs>
a half mile drive up Antone Mountain. Here on a very rainy day, we're just northwest of Dorset, Vermont, in Rupert at Merck Forest and Farmland Center with Tom Ward. And Tom, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Tell us why or what would be a great reason to visit here at uh, Merck Forest and Farmland Center. I know there are a lot. There are. There's, uh, there's plenty of things to do. Um, the one thing that's unique about Merck uh, Forest is that uh, on 3,200 acres, there's not a lot of mechanized development. So the quietude is one of the things that's most highly valued by the people who come back for repeat visits. Uh -huh. um, there's about 36 miles of roads and trails on the property. Uh, so there's plenty of opportunity to uh, either botanize, go birding, hiking, check out the flora and fauna and all the uh, glory up here. Um, but for the folks who get to take advantage of this, um, the fact that you have free access to the property year round, 365 days a year, um, is pretty unusual. There's not many places where you can go uh, where you're afforded free access to what we have to offer. Um, and here at Merck, uh, we have a, a fairly diverse farm. We have a couple of draft uh, animals. They're Suffolk Punch horses. They're sort of a rusty red. Uh, they're actually natives uh, of Britain, and uh, we're fortunate to have them. They're a, not the largest draft horses, but they're very easy to work around. Right. Um, uh, so it's a nice fit for us in terms of the educational programming we want kids to have as much access to the place, the property, and the animals as is reasonable. Right. Um, we currently have 17 ewes and a couple of rams, and I think we've got about 15 uh, lambs on the ground. Uh, we also uh, raise uh, chickens for eggs primarily, uh, some broilers as well. When somebody arrives uh, at the entrance, that was the Merck Homestead right at the, at the... It still is. It still is. One of his daughters uh, there lives now. there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's one of the more spectacular roads too, coming and visiting yeah. as you come up to the Merck Forest entrance. Right. And then you take a wonderful scenic dirt road ride up to the parking area mm -hmm. and from there walk in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's one of the things that allows us to offer the quietude and isolation. Uh, we're not on the grid um, and we are. Uh, dealing with some of the issues surrounding how we produce and use energy. Um, mm -hmm. Essentially, the sun is the uh, source of all the energy that we use. Tell me about the cabins, because people can not only come here for the day, they can mm -hmm. come and stay with you uh, for a night or several nights. We do. We have uh, several lean-tos, probably half a dozen around the property. Uh, some of them are close by, so uh, if you're not looking for as much of a physical challenge in getting out to where you might stay. Uh, we have that to offer. The cabins are enclosed and we have wood uh, to heat them uh, seasonally. And we have seven of those that uh, can house you know, as many as probably 10, uh, 12 people in some of them. And one of them is probably most comfortably occupied by two. Uh -huh. And it's actually, interestingly enough, uh, the viewpoint is one of the more popular ones because there's there's you and maybe one other person in an area that you essentially have a wonderful view and nobody within, you know, a mile. Year-round and uh, no fee to, to come and visit. Uh, and the website will be up to date with things that are going on at any given time. And that's MerckForest.org, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so people should go there and check that out. Well, I highly recommend a visit. This is an amazing place and an incredible asset on the uh, Stone Valley Byway. So thanks for spending some time with us. Happy to do so. All right, Tom. Thanks. Thanks. If we continue on from where we left the Stone Valley Byway, you'll find us just south of our next side trip onto Route 149, which takes us right into Granville, New York, and to the Slate Valley Museum. I'm with Kate Weller at the Slate Valley Museum here in Granville, New York. And while we're just outside of Vermont doing the 
story about the Vermont, Southern Vermont uh, byways. This has a, a, a real historic uh, story to tell where we are. And in fact, right behind you is the mural about uh, slate quarries and, and the slate history. Yes, this, this mural is actually a wonderful depiction of um, kind of the historic aspect of the quarrying in the beginning of the 20th century. It's done in the 1930s as part of a WPA project and actually hung in the Granville High School for a number of years. Mm -hmm. It was done by the artist Martha Levy and it really shows an amazing depiction from start to finish of the quarrying process. You can see the men uh, taking the large slabs of slate out of the quarry using uh, the, the quarry sticks, which are part of the landscape you no longer see, but which were really the main part of the quarrying industry, again, uh, starting after the Civil War into the 20th century. Really uh, something that was historically important that you've lost today. And then finally, the slate splitting and the trimming process. There are parts of the slate industry that have changed very dramatically from what you see in the mural, but there's a lot of it that has remained the same. So we now have heavy equipment that does a lot of the actual lifting and moving of the slate slabs out of the quarry up to the higher levels, but things like the splitting and trimming are all still done by hand. So this mural both shows the historic, but also elements of the modern uh, quarrying industry. And, and uh, slate is, um, um, working with it's incredible. I know, you, and we'll probably have a shot of where the uh, splitting up of the yeah. slate into a fan almost of, of a, that's incredible that you can do that and, and so you can literally peel off sections. Really it's stratified nature is the importance of slate and not only that the fact that it, it really is created in layers but also the strength of the layers it's not you know it's not as brittle as shale right. uh, and that is because of the way it's formed. Now, if you look at the way clay f our slate forms, it begins with clay that's been deposited over time. And those clay pieces do create layers, but the molecules themselves are at all different angles. Now, over time with pressure and with heat applied, all those molecules begin to align themselves together. And that that's what creates a very strong, but at the same time stratified um, stone. And because of that stratified mm -hmm. element in slate, it was perfect for slate roofing. You couldn't have marbleized, um, right. you know, tiles for your right. roofing. Um, uh, you can have a marble roof. It just won't happen that way. Slate still today, and if you our murals again, a great example of this. You can see the fo the image of the man splitting slate. That's still how it's done today. It's a hammer and chisel, and pretty much someone who can read a piece of slate knows how it's going to split, knows the best way it's going to split, and can actually see where there might be a crack or an imperfection, a piece of pyrite, something in it that's going to prevent it from splitting in a predictable way. When you come here to the museum, if, if you're coming uh, from Vermont, as you drive uh, along the road, there are these mounds of uh, uh, almost at first glance from a distance, you, you think, gee, the, uh, they're really doing a good job stacking their garbage. And as you come <laughs> closer, you realize that this is part of the old mining. When you quarry slate, about 90 to 95 percent of it is just waste slate. So what you're seeing as you're driving around was the slate that wasn't considered usable. And you're also, it's kind of uh, like the ghost of where those quarry sticks would have been. So you can imagine many of those slag piles would have had a larger quarry stick sticking out of it. And that was the, the element used to move um, slate from the bottom of the quarry up to the top level. Mm -hmm. So you're right, it's something that was very fundamentally part of the slate industry, something that really changed the landscape today, both on the New York and the Vermont side of the border. And it's now one of the few tangible reminders of some of these ancient quarries that have since disappeared. This area is unique because it has so many different colors of slate. Yeah, this or is. Or four, predominantly four colors, the red, the purple, the Red, uh, gray. the purple, the green. Um, you have the kind of the grays and the black. Um, but one of the things that's really unique about this area is exactly that. This is the rainbow slate capital of the world. You can go to other places in the world and get slate. And you can get slate that's a very good quality of slate. This is the only place in the world you're going to get red slate. Hmm. You, you can't, if you see, if you, you can go anywhere in the world and if you see a true red slate roof or even any element of that, you know that slate came from the Slate Valley. And that's a really interesting thing for people too, that this is something that 
really is very unique for just us. And this is the only place where you can get all of the colors represented. So you can get um, Slate from the Slate Valley and have just about every color available in the slate industry today, naturally at least. Where does the valley run from to? What's, what's the length? And well, um, the Slate Valley, it's a 30-mile stretch of land. It goes from a little bit north of Fairhaven, Vermont, and down to uh, Salem, New York on the south mm -hmm. end. And that's also very flexible, depending on who you talk to, depending on your criteria. Now, if you're looking at modern, the modern slate industry, it's much more concentrated. But if you're looking at historically, you had attempts at the slate industry and you had slate outcroppings in that whole area. Right. It's also very thin. So it's 30 miles long, but it's only about seven to nine miles wide. And it almost perfectly straddles Vermont and New York. So even though we're technically situated in New York, half of our history is in Vermont. So that's another um, big reason why we're such an important part of the Stone Valley is that this was in Vermont just as much as New York and was part of that larger stone industry of the 19th and 20th century. That's all amazing. And I'm so happy we had the time together to learn about this. And I thank you very much. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. Okay. Back on the Stone Valley Byway, we'll drive through Wells, past Lake St. Catherine, and into Pulteney. Along the way, we'll experience Lake St. Catherine. With its great camping and picnicking areas, swimming, and boating, with or without motors, the fishing is fine too. When we find ourselves in Pulteney, we explore a little bit. Checking out some of the shops. And the picturesque campus of Green Mountain College. I'm with Dennis at Whaleback Vineyards in Pulteney, Vermont. Dennis, thanks for letting us uh, visit. And um, we're right, this is one of the amazing places along the Stone Valley Byway. This is the, one of the, the wines, and you were telling me just a minute ago that the, uh, these labels. Our 17-year-old daughter, uh, Sadie, designed these did labels this. for right. us. Yeah. Picture of a couple whales um, with the sun kind of, kind of modern art type thing. That's wonderful. That's great. Um, tell us about the wines. Let's see, we have right here uh, five different kinds. We have a, a very dry, clear uh, apple blend from made from the wild apples on the farm. And, that's, what's, uh, that's what's in this glass, I believe. And uh, some of the local orchard apples blended together. Um, we have a Moonlight Vermont, which is a blend of several of our white grapes. It's kind of a, a Chardonnay-like wine with a citrus aftertaste. Um, we have a Frontenac Gris Rosé, which is extremely fruity, um, uh, semi-dry, um, just a, a really good rosé without the typical sweet aftertaste that a rosé has. Mm. Um, we have a St. Croix, which is a very smooth red wine, um, kind of like a, a an oak Cabernet in a lot of ways. And we have a Marquette, which is a, a lot more intense wine with a lot of um, raspberry bouquet to it and, and uh, uh, a lot of tannins that follow up and hang in there for a while. This is very good, by the way. This is the apple wine. It's really quite nice. It's, a, it's a, not your typical heavy apple wine. It's a, it's a very clear, crisp wine. Right. Oh, it's delicious. In addition to making wine, 
Dennis and his wife Amy sell brewing and wining supplies. And Vermont maple syrup. They also promote local artists. Changing the Art Monthly. Our final leg of the journey takes us continuing north from Poultney, past Castleton, up to Bomazine. Along the way, we visited Castleton State College. Our adventure took us to Lake Bomazine with spectacular views. Okay, we're here with Dr. Tim Grover from Castleton College, and, and Tim is a professor of geology, and we are in front of what is known as the fold, which is a great example of a number of things we're gonna be talking about, but one is uh, learning about how slate is formed and how marble is formed, and I'm gonna step aside a little bit and let you go. Okay, All I, right? I think to answer that question, um, both slate and marble are examples of what we call metasedimentary rocks. So they're sedimentary rocks that have gone through a process of metamorphism. And to then answer the question, we have to learn about where those sediments were deposited and then how they were metamorphosed. So um, if we look at this graphic, um, both these rocks are probably late Cambrian in age, the marble in the area and the slate as regards to when they were orig originally deposited. So that's about 510 million years ago. And North America was in a very different place than it is currently 510 million years ago. Where we were was uh, just south of the equator. Uh, the Green Mountains didn't exist. The Adirondack Mountains were eroding away. New Hampshire wasn't even attached to North America at that point in time. And the situation that existed was off the coast of North America, there was a beach. And at this time, the beach actually would have been right near about where about Whitehall is, depositing some sandstones. And then just offshore, in a very warm, shallow water environment, much like might exist off the coast of Australia today, there were limestones being deposited because there was lots of organic activity. And marble turns out to be metamorphosed limestone. Further offshore, on the continental slope and continental rise, deeper ocean sediments were being deposited. And then these deep ocean sediments are shales. These are the rocks that are going to become the slates. The limestones being deposited here are the rocks that are being, going to become marble. Further to our present day east, there was actually a subduction zone where part of the North American North American plate was being subducted underneath a piece of land. Well, we'll just say there was an, a volcanic arc forming out here. So there were, uh, there were volcanoes, maybe much like off the, where Japan is today. And what's going to happen is North America is moving to the east, or this volcanic arc is moving to the west. And when those two things collide, these sediments that are right here end up getting pushed up on top of the limestones right here. And both the sediments and the limestones get metamorphosed. So you end up with a situation that might look something like this, where this stuff in the deep ocean is getting pushed up on top of the North American continent. Folds are forming, and if you look at the shape of this fold right here, it approximates the shape of this fold right here where we have a very steep limb and a very shallowly dipping limb. So this would be the steep part right here and this would be the shallowly dipping part right here. And this structure right here is called a fault because the rocks have actually broken there. So when the volcanic arc collided with North America, the rocks got bent and broken. And when that happens, we call that a period of mountain building and metamorphism happens during mountain building. Now, the, the evidence we have for this is, is, is very strong. If we look at this rock, we can see some original sedimentary layering 
the light and dark colors, or even the part with the mustard colored lichen and the part with very little or the gray lichen represent original sedimentary layers. And you can see how they go up and then down. So what happened was that way is present day east. When the volcanic arc collided with North America, these rocks got pushed up and we ended up with a fold that looks like this. And geologists call that fold a syncline. And this particular fold right here is sometimes referred to as the Glen Lake syncline because we're right adjacent to Glen Lake or the West Castleton syncline or the Scotch Hill syncline because Scotch Hill is right behind us there. When these rocks were put on top of the limestones, they were buried within the crust a little bit and metamorphosed from shales into slates. And when that happened, a new, what a geologist calls a fabric, developed in the rock. And you can see there's a strong planar orientation to the rock parallel to my hand. And this is what we call a slaty cleavage. So in the slate quarries, uh, where the cleavage is well developed and the rock is very splittable upon those cleavage planes, that makes a good product to quarry because it breaks into nice thin sheets that might be used for, say, roofing. Um, it doesn't always do that, and this cleavage isn't always developed so nicely, but here is a great example of that. When these rocks got pushed up on top of the carbonate rocks of the limestones, the limestones were then metamorphosed into marble. Rutland lies within what we call the Marble Valley. There's a lot of marble there. Those same rocks actually go underneath us right here. If we were to drill down, we'd hit those marbles, and they come out as unmetamorphosed sediments to the west in basically around the Whitehall area. And that's about the story that I have. That's a great story. Thank you very much. And uh, this is an amazing example. The coloring, what is, this is just the lichen, so it's, it's, that's, that's not embedded in the stone. That's not embedded in the stone, but there's a neat story I've been told as to why the lichen is limited to certain layers. The, the rocks have different chemical compositions and this variety of lichen likes the rock that has a little bit more calcium in it. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of geology and botany combined where you can see the, the more calcic rich rocks have some lichen and the less calcic rich rocks don't. And then up there, there's another lichen rich layer and a lichen poor layer. So they help define the layering. And it, it, again, it's a bit of geology and biology combined. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And I think this is a, an amazing example of what goes on along the, the uh, byways of Southern Vermont. It is, and I, if I could just, the collision between the volcanic arc in North America occurred about 460 million years ago. And that's when the roots of New Hampshire formed. And towards the end of that, we had the initial uplift of the Green Mountains. So the Green Mountains weren't even here while all this was happening and they probably developed towards the end of that mountain period, mountain building event known as the Taconic Orogeny. Yeah, good to know. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, my pleasure. So we've learned about a very diverse place in a section of Vermont along the Stone Valley Byway. It took us up two mountains, down into the quarries, and even back 500 million years. We hope you've enjoyed this journey. I know I have. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.